Okay, so this was, um, thanks for putting up with that. <laughs> and really to gesture. So it's really good to follow after the connect. Um, this is, um, the metaphor of the jigsaw I think is really interesting for me because I think this is a very complex subject that your project is addressing. And I've been thinking about it and working in some hospitals and Centre for Yarnes Care, the Brain Injury and Severely Disabled Institutes for many years. Uh, testing different things, testing gesture applications. And I'm not showing many videos this time. I'm showing sort of um, a thinking about it, I hope. So um, I got a company, it's called Soundscapes. That's me, no, no employees. <laughs> It's much simpler. Cyber therapy. I'm not, I'm not into words. I'm, I, you see lots of words. I'm not really into words. People say cyber therapy, um, virtual interactive space, um, virtual augmented, mixed augmented reality, blah, blah, blah. So I'm not really into words. So some of them mean the same. So, But this is quite nice. This is from um, somebody that Torben met. You might have seen this slide before. It, it's, a, it's a reference of... Virtual reality, because people call games virtual reality as well. When we go out <coughs> to conferences and what have you, people say virtual reality. Okay, so virtual reality integrates real-time computer processing, body tracking, and interface devices, sensory displays to immerse a participant in a computer-generated simulated environment within such controllable, dynamic, and interactive 3D <coughs> stimulus environments Behavioural action can be recorded and measured. I think that's quite nice, a nice statement because there was two interesting questions posted early on. One was about the clinical evidence, which is a huge problem within this field. The other is the different abilities. You mentioned disability, but the different abilities of people. Because over the years, there's always been this question that I posit of what is normal in a person being able to move a specific way. And it's a great challenge to look at somebody and how they express themselves and how a stimulus can really affect them. Now whether that affects them with intent, consciously, or you can stimulate them subconsciously gets to be a very interesting uh, problem. So what I'm going to try and... Oh, this is an animated slide. Huh? There's more jigsaw pieces coming in here. Yeah? So, there we go. So, I was asked to do some stories about how challenging it is to work in the borderland between motivating technologies, engaged staff in hospitals and patients in the pursuit of playful, healthy games. So, I was born into a family with disability, my uncles. And when I was uh, a kid, I used to do some music stuff. And I used to hack, lots and lots of hacking. And I used to make ways for them to express themselves. And um, when I started um, looking at this field, because I got a bit bored of music, the, the former structure of music, I started working with biofeedback, sensors on the body. It became very clear that putting things on someone was not the way forward. You could get data from it, yes, um, but the process of gelling somebody up with sensors and the controllability, the different lag times of the different parts of the body, given information, relevant to the stimulus, was not really conducive to Good research. Okay. And then I went forward from the biofeedback to work with different sensors. I introduced you to some of the techniques I have. I saw this. This is out next year. You might be interested in this. It's a dedicated journal, uh, Games for Health. Um, I also worked, uh, I worked at the activity center in Aarhus um, for many years, exploring this uh, in the 90s. And that was working with... Uh, uh, um, infrared volumetric sensors. I know at the time people thought it was really crazy, but it worked. Huh? I'm not going to talk about how it works. It works. We know it works. You wouldn't be here otherwise. Then in 97, I did a presentation in Aarhus Hospital, and the physiotherapy um, lady, Anderson, and it was Gita Anderson, I think, um, put me in touch with Alborg University to do a presenta presentation for Year of the Brain. I did that, and then the director from the Centre for Yarnes the Centre for the Brain Injury in Marcellusburg Hospital in Aarhus, asked me to work with her because I was putting gesture to control robotic lights 
gesture to control um, visuals, gesture to control sounds. Then she moved to Copenhagen and I worked there. So we had a funded project to work and it was sent to be on together. One of the games, we started working with games, gesture control games, about 97, 98, working with Macromedia Flash. And um, it's very basic, plane flying. And then also worked with a dolphin, which was very interesting. I can show you afterwards if I've got time. So wireframe dolphin and how we mapped it, because mapping is a big challenge in this, mapping the input information to what it does in the game to make this person play with that game in a, in a meaningful way. So what we did, we worked with two ultrasound sensors. An ultrasound is a linear sensor. So rather than a volume of information, it's a, a line of information. So we worked with brain injured, whereby the dolphin was catching fish as it came down on the screen. So it moved the dolphin. And it was a really nice looking model. And one sensor would make it go left and right. The other model made it go up and down. So what we did, we got the therapist to work with the brain damaged people. Um, therapist moving one way, brain damaged working the other way, with a target of progress towards the person with brain injury doing both. A bit like this, huh? It's really tough, even with your full abilities. But it was really, really interesting. So that worked. But what was really interesting, observing all of the studies, was that I'd made a big sheet of paper on the wall. We had 10 users, and I put their names up there. And the game had different scores. It had how many fish, the time, all the factors you have in games. And there was these categories. And the first thing they did, they, they'd come in through this door, and they were quite damaged. They'd come up, the first thing, they'd look at the scores. <laughs> <laughs> and they would go away, go away from there, they'd say, shit, no, I'm going to get him, I'm going to get one more fish today. <laughs> and so really you can see this motivational factor of games really, really being very strong. Now then, why I showed you this at the start, is that for many years people have been working with music, different interfaces to allow people to express themselves with um, sound. In England, a team from Bristol did it. But if you go right away, way back to about uh, 1919, 1920, the theremin, based on body conductance, huh? gesture, it's information, what you do with that information. Huh? So I can show you this afterwards. Um, but what happened within this study was that it became very, very clear the importance of the facilitator. It wasn't just the product. You can give someone a product, it is how you use that product. So it wasn't about trying to get rid of the physiotherapists or anything, it was giving them tools to better manage that time with that patient and to motivate that patient towards self-regime and to give information, because you're talking about information, this is just information, but that's information that goes to sound, sound for you, but it's also, also information that makes sense based on the movement, the syncopation of my gestures, rather than to a, 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 a phrase. So in the end, what we ended up doing is that it wasn't what just one product, it was a mix and match system. So I had volumetric sensors, linear sensors, cameras, computer vision was improving. Um, so, so when we talk about soundscapes now, soundscapes has evolved over the years, my PhD was based on the requirements of a system. And the requirements of the system became more of a research platform to share, to discuss, and to work with people. Because I'm not a therapist. I'm an old artist, work with, work with media, art, media art, interactive spaces. Huh? And along the way, I've met some neurologists who've told me what you're doing is, you're, is, is the afferent efferent neural feedback loop closure. Some of you might know what that means. Basically, you're doing something you're getting, getting stimulated, you're closing this loop, and then you forget about the movements you're making because your interface is there with the dolphin, or huh? whatever the game is. So it's to get to that point where you have that movement that you're not thinking about. You're not looking at the primary movement. You're being stimulated this way with your brain from whatever that design of that content is relevant to what's going on inside to trigger a movement that, is, that that's information mapped in a meaningful way to that and what you need to do then is to adapt that information and adapt this information to each individual. So it's a system. And don't forget the human process because whatever that system is, you have the human and you have the technical. And the research is based upon looking at the whole and the part because each 
part becomes a whole, and you subdivide it out to look at the information that's going on there, how you can refine that. But it's very interesting when you start looking at different interfaces, a camera, for example, where you have stillness. When I worked with the severely disabled, we would have a volume of information by the head here, because the head is usually the last remaining movement they would have. So by putting this information here, they could go into this space, they could make sounds or visuals, whatever stimulated them, but they could come out of that space. It wasn't an on button, it didn't have an off button. So by going in here and coming out, by me facilitating the sessions, making lots, lots of mistakes, lots of wrong decisions, you could interpret what was going on with that person that couldn't speak to me. But was this, I'm tired, I want to finish this session. Okay, I just need to pause, I need to change. Change the content, change the resolution of this space. So it becomes a very interesting design factor of how you create the active zones and the non-active zones. And if that is dynamic, how is it dynamic? Is it lines? Is it a zone? All these different factors. So, this is quite relevant to the Connect side of things, because this is the Connect, but the limitations, if I can say this about the Connect, is it is 3D, but it's not 360 degrees. And you do have this problem with occlusion, because if my hand goes behind my back, now you can't see that, because you are the camera, look at my hand. But that's information, it's data that's telling you what's going on behind the back. And by looking at that information, you can see of some progress in perhaps movement behind the back. So this was a company called Organic Motion. I brought them to Odin's uh, Torben a month ago, was it? Your guys came, I think? Yeah. yeah. So, and it's really, really quite nice. And people are now looking at this, rather than the markers, as was said, it's just no markers at all, but you're surrounded by cameras. And you've got di different resolution of the, of the system. The problem with this type of system, you know, I'm a professor, so I keep off the black hat. There's always problems. I'm always <laughs> criticizing this. So basically, the problem with something like that then is they don't have the games, like the Kinect has, that motivation. So how do you get over that? You work with the Kinect and you work with the system. You mix and match. Most, most systems have got a, a, a plus. Most systems have got a negative. But look, let's look at the pluses and let's put the pluses together. Let's try and put the negatives to one side, huh? Is this finish? The precision side of things, uh, you're talking about the high resolution. Mm. This system is, um, it doesn't go through the retrieval of body gesture as you, you explained. It's much more real time, it's much faster. And the camera's about 200 frames per second. But, <laughs> as you said exactly, when, when, when the Kinect came out, it was like a dream for us, you know, something about a thousand crowns and you could hack it. I spoke to, um, <laughs> I, well you can, eh? so I spoke to, so, Sony's been helping me out, you know, I write letters and I, I beg, I'm very good at begging. I, I wrote to um, Sony, you know, SCEE is called, Sony Computer Entertainment Europe, based in, in London, and in um, Denmark, Egmont, what they call interactive, film interactive, all the film interactive, and they send me stuff. Huh? I got loads and loads of games, loads of um, eye toy stuff. Huh? And I said, well, how about looking at this field? How about games for disabled people, for people who have different abilities? And then they took it, this Mike Haig and all these, the higher, yes, we've got a board meeting, we discussed it, but no, no, that's not the market we want to go for. And I, I, I get a bit, I provocate a lot, I like provocating. And um, it's quite interesting then the feedback you get and then seeing where the market's going. Because as, as the opening slide said, it's a huge market this year. There's a huge uh, increment of aged people and uh, the service industries of the future are struggling to address that. So basically, mixing and matching, you have to look at what movement the therapist wants relevant for what the session can do, the goal of the session. Is it a movement like this? Is it a more natural movement? Um, is it a camera view you're looking at, like I showed you just now? And so what I used to do, I used to make different sensors. They weren't hacked, they were original. <laughs> and, um, and then mapped them. Martin up in Aarhus used to help me. So I used to map it. It's just information, just MIDI information. It was mapping it to lights. And we showed it some at the Olympics in 96 and 2000, whatever. So what is this again? <laughs> That's lasers, and this is based on lasers. Though you can't hear it now. But this is based on lasers. 
And I never work with lasers. And when this came out, I thought, this is, this is quite interesting. But it's just event information. It isn't dynamic. So again, that's the negative side of it. So if you know the limitations, then you can work with the limitations. This is quite nice because as well as playing music, you can map this to games. But the games are terrible. So my students and I will get this and I will go and make some games to it. Okay. So some of the products that I quite like is the, uh, the old product, which you probably know about. Gesture Tech got the patent on a lot of the camera-based stuff. Sony for the eye I had to pay them a patent. But if you go to their website, there's lots of people who've been using this and comparing the old Mandela system against some of the more modern stuff like um, now you connect with the eye toy because um, you've got something to measure against uh, to look at it. So if you are interested in this, go there. There's loads of research papers. Beams, this is what you have here. Lots of people are talking Christmas gifts. My company sells them in Denmark. <laughs> um, <laughs> NeuroSky, my company is also selling this in Denmark. And this is the NeuroSky. This is um, quite nice. Now, most EEG um, systems are wet, you have gels on you, they're uncomfortable. And so this is um, something that's just out in Germany being distributed. So uh, you can have a look at that afterwards if you want. I like talking a lot as well, sorry. Um, but my students, they make stuff like this. Basically, this is the old, like, like the old uh, gesture tech system, color tracking. Red glove doing something, you know, it's... But I, I, I really think that by preparing someone for a session, it's, um, and especially the situation, if you're in a hospital, if you're in a clinic, there's a mindset that's involved. And it's so hard to really, really research somebody playing, I think, in a clinic situation. Or if you're telling someone this is going to be therapy. <coughs> but how do you do that when you go to a hospital? There's something wrong with me. Okay, you do this. And it's how to overcome that. How to get to that point where I talked about here. In that situation, I'll give you an example. In 99, I did some work for DR, and people watching classical music on television was declining. They're doing this, huh? Same, different tunes, what have you. So I said, okay, we don't touch the music, let's talk about visualizing the music. So, so I worked with then a choir, and it was up in Aarhus, just outside Aarhus, Studio 12 of Water, they got a round wall. So we had two beamers with a guy, the conductor, in the shadow inside the, what was being, being projected. W what you've got, you've got a conductor, huh? that's the information, it's gesture information. So what I did was I got the sounds, I'm an old musician, got the sounds, got the, got, the, got the score, got the tape. It was very gothic -y, so I wrote this uh, visualization of a, of a stained glass window of a church. But it was black. As he comes up, you've got 50 people there. Put them in white sheets, which they weren't very happy about, but put them in white sheets. <laughs> and uh, he comes up, and he had a, a painting suit on, the white paint suit. Then he comes up, so I put three volumetric sensors in front of him. And he said, YouTube, Sherman 56, my side, you have a look. And he was just, his, his task was to conduct these singers, okay? That's what he was focused on. So as he went in, he opened up the red filter, green filter, and the blue filter. So what he was doing, he was painting the stained glass windows. Okay? When he finished, he came out. Because it was for TV, we did about six takes. Between the first take and the sixth take, his movements went from this to this. Okay? And I asked him afterwards, how was that for you? All the time, like the air around my body was electrified. Ah, okay, great. Do you realize what happened? That you moved from this to this? No, I didn't. <laughs> yes, you did. And showed him. Now, uh, analogize from that situation into the situation with people who have problems with their movement, where you're trying to stimulate them to move more. You said about the burn victims. Yeah. Yeah? But try, I, I totally believe that if you go in and tell someone, the, uh, the delivery is important. I'll give you another example. We did the work with Century Young together, people, and it was a wireframe game where you were to move dynamically through a space. If you move fast enough through a space, it would let go of the virtual reality ball. Okay? If you didn't move fast enough through that space, that virtual hand wouldn't let go of the ball. So we were doing this, and we did a little experiment. So I said to the, the guy, to let go of the ball, you have to move your hand through this space at a certain dynamic speed. Then the other the half, the, half the users, the other half the users, I said, you have to move your hand through the space at a certain speed to let go of the ball. Now there's a difference in the delivery. Did you hear it? There's a difference in what was first. What was first? in one sense was letting go of the ball, then the hand, and the other half was movement of the hand to let go of the ball. 
the ones that we've given first priority to the board to let go of, their focus was on the virtual feedback rather than on the hand which is the primary delivery of the instruction. So this targeting the play is so important, not targeting the therapy to me as a non-medical guy. But I think that's what we're heading towards, how to stimulate subliminally and subconsciously towards this play aspect. You notice that this was one of your images. What is so good about the Connect is we can access the content. We, because we can go with the SDKs straight into the PCs, we can hack the games and we can hack this space. And that's what's so good about it, better than the Wii or the iToy. But, your question, clinical evidence. Always this problem. And what we need to do then is the situation. You need to create situations of control. So look at that person in the space. How do you do that? <coughs> Including eye tracking to inform design. You look at the, the reaction of that person to the playing of that game. You look at the situation, three, three, 3D tracking, 360 degree tracking this is, where you look all the way around them. You, you collect the data, your usability spaces. You have to annotate, and it takes forever and ever, what's going on in these spaces. You look then, you correlate that data to the game data. What happens in that game? How is that person being stimulated? Then by seeing that, then you can change the game, or you can change this space. And that could be whether resolution, or physically moving where it is. So soundscapes. The user experience we target is somebody coming into a space, playing the game. Okay, basically, um, the therapist, the designer, facilitator, participant. The, the person comes in, the participant only sees the facilitator. So you get that intersubjective situation going on, and you're targeting intersubjective stimuli towards progress. And the, and the, the, the forward data, the primary data you're capturing, <coughs> is mapping the multimedia here. But because it's data that you can ca capture and extract, you can look at progress between session to session to session. You can build up profiles of each person and the treatment. So what's actually there is much more complex. You've got all of this mapping. What do you map into? What are you targeting? Ludic engagement, let's get a, a playful situation. I target creative expression, play, playful interactivity, motivation. So and what are the affordances coming from the content? So we'll look here. And it's very complex, like I said. So this is what we try and educate our students at the university with, looking at these different facets of it. It's a very complex thing to address. And they need to work with people. So many different things you can mix and match within these situations. So it's like a big compendium that you have. So from my PhD, I've got two models. One is called Zoom, the zone of optimized motivation. And that's where when you target a, 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 um, a skill level with a game and you're able to change, you're able to increment that change towards that next level, to that next level of development, that next level of challenge, how long do you leave it when they drop out through that change before either bringing it back into that projection, that safe zone to keep them engaged with the, uh, uh, with the achievements, or do you leave, how long do you leave it go until they, they, they learn it and they get to the next point? You understand? It's a little bit complex, but I've written a lot about it. So there's flow involved, if you know Csikszentmihalyi, Vygotsky's uh, ZPD, uh, we call it aesthetic resonance, and microdevelopment, this scalloping from development is a really, really interesting uh, uh, analogy again, going from learning and training into this scenario. So this thing of looking at different fields, not just the healthcare, not just games, but mixing and matching from that side as well. The other model is looking at how do you, how long, two minutes, wow, how do you evaluate this? And I can't do that in two minutes, but basically, <laughs> basically you keep looking, looking, looking at prior sessions. You keep le learning from sessions user using perhaps the connect, perhaps the Wii, whatever. So this is the lab we have at the moment. We work with a system called Noldus. It's the, uh, the, 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 the validated uh, behavioral analysis system. We have multiple cameras that we look at in the space and we have a large, large screen to immerse the person into the, exper into the experience that we're targeting. This is my last slide just about. This is where I think we're heading. 
360 degrees markerless motion tracking, no occlusion. Like I said, mixing with a connect or, or, or some game situation that, that motivates the person. It has to be adaptive. Um, in artificial intel intelligence, in game scenarios, there's something called DDA, which is dynamic difficulty adjustment. And that's like rubber banding if you're playing a, a car game and you're not a very good car driver, the program will bring you up to it so it's still competitive, or the other way around. Eh? So it's called DDA. It has to be easy, easy to use. Why? To use the people that are going to be working with this in the hospitals are therapists. They're not paid to learn systems very often. They have to learn on the job. And it's a, it's a huge challenge to get those people to understand it. So what Soundscapes, what I've done now, I've built a studio, it isn't there yet, finished yet, but next year it's going to be ready, to train people in using some of these toys, tools, and to discuss these things. Um, the analysis of it has to be very um, uh, uh, strategically and, 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 and uh, systematically addressed, looking at inaction, the intervention, and looking at the on-action, the evaluation, um, and, the f and the funding and infrastructure for the consultancy and staff. F and NF stands for formal and non-formal, because within learning, there is formal learning in situations like university, like colleges, but there's also non-formal, and non-formal is play situations. Thank you.